Hello, ME310ers. I wanted to give you a few pointers on the paper bike documents before they become due. And the thing to remember is that these documents are basically um, a prequel to the documents we're going to do at the end of the quarter. I have, I'm going to start off with a couple of slides from George Toy, which I really like. The, the first one is kind of what we've experienced from industry, which is that design process information is not captured very well. You have this complicated design process with uh, branches and in the end what gets saved is some CAD information, some data, some documentation, and so the ability to reconstruct what happened next is, is not that much. In contrast, we're in academia and our ability to um, capture information is better, we focus on it. So we want to know why the design evolved in the way that it did. We want to understand the rationale, the requirements that it was responding to, the uh, context of the project, the needs that it was addressing, so that there's a, a better ability to, to reconstruct the design process. And in particular, if for some reason, under different circumstances, it would make sense to take the design in a different direction, we have enough information to do that. So as you look at the outline for the bike design documents, which are the same, by the way, as they are for the end quarter, what you see is what's on slide three here, which is the major sections of the report. You want to document the need that your project addresses, the, the context behind it. Now, in the case of the paper vehicle thing, nobody really needs a paper vehicle, so that, that section's a little artificial, but there is a clear problem statement, and then you um, can describe what requirements your design um, had to fulfill, and you can describe the uh, approach by which you developed your design. In particular, it's useful to uh, document what you learned. And then specifications, the difference between specifications and requirements is that requirements are what the design needs to do. Specifications are what it physically is. So if you have CAD drawings or dimensions or its actual weight, that's where you put it, is in the specification section. And then finally, what recommendations you have going forward and also your reflections of your team design process. And um, not coincidentally, these, these words that are highlighted on this slide are in fact the section headings of the document. And I'll make one more comment here, which is that sometimes people find that it's easier to do first describe the development approach. So what was your approach, your development of the design? and then follow that with requirements. And if you find that easier, that's fine. We have two templates that you can use for the report. You don't have to use either of them, but, um, but why wouldn't you? Uh, so the first one, my favorite, is actually to use uh, Overleaf. If you Google Stanford Overleaf, it's a very nice multi-author editing system. If you eventually want to do a PhD thesis, it's probably what you're going to use if you do papers and international journals and conferences, you'll probably use it. And uh, the new version of Overleaf version 2 actually includes things like chat windows and documentation of uh, comments and marking up things when you have multiple authors working on a, on a document. And the, um, there's, a, there's a template for the paper bike docs that you can upload and then it's just a matter of um, filling in the content and it will automatically generate table of contents and figure numbering and cross-references and bibliography and, and all those things. There's even a built-in thing in LaTeX to do glossary words, but I actually think it's probably more trouble than it's worth for just paper bikes. There's also an MS Word template. It is what I call a weak template model, meaning that it doesn't really, in, the way Word works, it doesn't absolutely enforce the template. If somebody pastes, copies and pastes stuff in that is not consistent with the template, it will break it. However, if you're careful and you do paste special so that you don't break the template, uh, it should work to do auto numbering of captions, cross references, and table of contents. All right, what I'd like to do in the next few slides is I'm, I've pulled some pages from uh, some recent bike documents, and I'm just going to quickly go through and talk about uh, issues that um, I noticed on them that may come up for you as well. And um, by the way, probably the single best thing to do when writing your own 
bike document is to go through some of the uh, example hard copies that are lying around in the loft. They're in a box in the middle of the loft and peruse through them and see what sorts of comments the teaching team had on what's there and use that as a guide in writing your own documents. All right, so let's start with the executive summary. It's a short section, but it's important. It's especially important for the end quarter reports. It is longer than the abstract would be for a paper or for a technical report. It typically runs to a couple pages, and the whole point of it is that it should be a standalone synopsis of your project. It's, called, um, it's an executive summary. You can think of it, if you like, as being the only section that a busy executive would actually read. So it is something that you should be able to separate from the rest of the report and give to the boss of whoever your corporate liaison is, and it should be enough for them to get the gist of what you did. So here's one, um, page one of a, an executive summary, and it's a pretty good one, although the reason I pulled it out to talk about is that the figure here, we, we do like to have one or two figures in an executive summary. I think it would be better to use an action figure, what it actually looks like when somebody's sitting on the vehicle and it's being pulled, so you really get a sense of what it's like to use. This is a CAD red ring, and it shows how it's constructed, and I think there's an appropriate place for that later in the document, but it might not be what you want to use on page one of the executive summary. After the executive summary, there's a very short section called glossary. And the idea behind glossary, again, this is really aimed more at the end quarter reports than the paper bike document. Um, it is a sign of a creative team that the team starts to coin new phrases, new terminology. And any, and also, is if you're working in a particular area where there are some um, technical terms that are not obvious, this is where you put them. It's so that the reader has a quick place to find out where um, a, a particular uh, term or a particular expression, what it means. You don't need to put obvious terms here, but um, for example, this team actually did a nice job. They have something called a collar, and it isn't obvious what collar means in the context of their design. Um, they had a harness. Um, they had uh, some other a saddle, a specialized term. What does the saddle mean in the context of their design? So basically anything non-obvious, um, you could put it in the glossary. Then we go to some uh, preliminary information, the background of the project. And uh, there's a need statement and a problem statement. Now again, these make more sense for the corporate projects. No nobody really needs a paper vehicle, so you have the opportunity to say something fairly straightforward or to be creative. Uh, it doesn't have to be long. A paragraph's plenty. The problem statement is largely your team's interpretation of the problem statement as given here. Um, the paper bikes are different from the corporate projects because we actually tell you what to design. For the corporate projects, you have to decide on your own what the problem is that you're addressing. Um, in either case, it should be your interpretation. So in other words, don't just sort of regurgitate the uh, assignment, but rather what it, what, how you interpreted it and what you decided was important. Then we go into, uh, so as I said, then the next section could either be design development or you could go straight into requirements. If, um, in either case, when you do come to the requirements, we do like to use this three-column table format where you first have a brief description of what the requirement is, and then metrics. Metric is a value. If, uh, if you assert that your design is easy to push, well, wh what's easy? Is it, I mean, uh, is it, is it uh, 10 kilograms, or uh, is it that any member of the team can push it without breaking a sweat for at least three minutes? Uh, and and so forth. Uh, if the bike weight, it should be lightweight. Well, how light is light? Uh, and so forth. And then finally, rationale is well. Why why is this requirement important enough to list? There's actually quite a bit more information about requirements in the um, information on the wiki associated with the paper bike documents, and it's it's worthwhile to peruse that. But the other really useful thing to do is to look at what other previous teams have done when they were challenged to formulate requirements for paper vehicles. Now, 
The paper vehicle challenge changes a little bit from year to year, but they're not all that different. They're still paper, they still have to support a human being, they still have to be pushed or pulled and, and so forth. And so um, you definitely, I think, will get some ideas by leafing through what different teams, and you'll see some of them did a, a, a better or worse job in terms of articulating those requirements, and you'll see notes from the teaching team uh, about those requirements, and it's definitely worth having a look. And finally, uh, before I leave this requirement section, why is this important? It's important because the way that you decide whether a design is a good one or not is whether it meets the requirements. And we, we can argue endlessly about whether something has an intuitive user interface or uh, whether it's comfortable for the rider, but then we have to go another level of detail down. Like, well, what does it mean to be comfortable? And um, what does it mean to have an intuitive user interface? How would we actually measure whether something was or wasn't? For example, um, can you use this design without reading an instruction manual? Well, in the case of a paper bike, I would hope so. All right, let's move on to the next section. Uh, design development, it's often useful to have a sort of very front um, short part where you give kind of your team's vision of the design and then talk a little bit about it just have a little bit of a preamble where you talk about what's going to come next in terms of your development process or um, in terms of your development strategy and it may help you to make a little diagram to help define that process as as this team did by all means include lots of pictures here uh, and this is where we hope you actually have been taking lots of pictures of your design and testing and iteration process as you went. And the important thing here is to capture what you learned. So if you did a certain test, that's fine, but what did you learn from that test? How did it, how did it modify the design or how did it cause you to change some of the features of your design? So in this picture and below, the teams had to go over obstacles and the text associated with the image at the bottom is about how they discovered they needed to modify their design so that people's feet didn't get hung up on some speed bumps that were implemented in the field. Sometimes you may find it's useful to have a table where you um, list some design choices and trade-offs, and if you do, that actually is often helpful for the reader. And finally, you may recall that in class we talked about some ways of helping to discover requirements by doing either a, a breakdown, this one slides a little fuzzy I realize, but basically a, a breakdown of, of the requirements of a, of a vehicle in terms of the rider or the pusher. Um, and you may recall seeing this slide um, from a little over a week ago where you have uh, the rider and the pusher and you think about the various subsystems of the design and whether these different elements of the design are serving the rider or serving the pusher. And that is a nice way sometimes to help discover requirements. But also if you do use a diagram like this to sort of organize your thinking about the design and what it does, then by all, the, the point I'm making now, why I'm putting it in this little presentation, is that by all means do put this diagram into your design development section and talk a little bit about it. And you may recall that there was a different diagram that we used which was more of a um, user action focused view of things. So here we have the rider in blue and the pusher in red and we look at the things they have to do and then you look at what elements of the design are um, satisfying those actions. And again if you have a diagram like that it's useful to use and so here's a nice example of a team that did um, a physical breakdown of the various systems of their bike and the frame and the wheels and so forth and it, it was part of their design development process. So then um, you finish design development uh, and uh, you can, um, if you haven't already had a requirement section then that would come after the design development. And then finally, you have some description of the physical design as it is. The idea of the specification section is that ideally there should be just enough information that if I had to kind of more or less recreate your design, I could do it. So I, I would like to see some sketches maybe, some CAD drawings if you have any, um, dimensions, um, how you assembled some things. It doesn't have to be a very long section, 
but uh, it should kind of make it clear how, how the design comes together. And then there's a short section on recommendations for future work. Every design in the class could be improved. And in particular, uh, if you had any failures that occurred during the rally, and I know many of you did, well, at least some did, uh, those are obvious uh, candidates for some, some redesign. So here is a team that had a tube failure uh, on their long pulling poles, and they have some suggestions about how those could be reinforced. As we get to the end of the document, there's a planning section, and what you do doesn't have to be as detailed as this. We don't really require a Gantt chart. However, it is useful to have a basic outline where, um, I guess the point is, is, is not just to say what you did, but um, kind of how the flow of the, of the project went. And in particular, it's interesting to note whether anything took a lot longer or contrarily, whether it went faster than you anticipated that it would. And then finally, we end the document with some reflections on the design process. And again, this is sort of useful to, to um, think about after the fact about how the team process worked and what was clear and whether there were any communications issues and so on. And so I'm going to um, sort of finish up here with a, a nice couple of examples. This was a, a team that made the X-Wing Chopper bike. You can see it up on one of the beams in the middle of the ME310 loft. It's pretty much the only paper bicycle within the last 15 years that actually looks like a bicycle. And uh, it was built by a very high-powered team. Uh, these guys went on to become very successful entrepreneurs. They founded companies. One of them is quite successful now in particular. And uh, they had some interesting team dynamics because they were all very high-powered and opinionated. And I'm going to show in the next slide the blog of one of the teammates. And uh, as you read it, you can just sort of think about whether this person is a bit like you or like somebody on the team and um, how you might work well or not so well with somebody who has this approach to things. All right, so um, that ends this short um, annotated presentation. We look forward to seeing the paper bike documents. We will mark them up extensively, again, mainly because it's a way of providing you with some, some concrete feedback to try to make the end quarter reports as good as possible. See you Tuesday.